Welcome again uh, to Phil Heads Fern Life Cycles and Identification, this Jepson uh, uh, Herbarium mini workshop. And we're going to start off with a, uh, uh, an introduction to ferns at the most basic level, which is what are ferns? And we probably think of this as kind of a silly question. Um, everyone in this audience, of course, has an interest in ferns, so you wouldn't be here. And everyone, I'm sure, has a uh, uh, conception in their head of, of what a fern is. And it probably includes some, but maybe not all, of the, uh, the organisms I have pictured here. Um, and I'm not going to give it away as to which of these are ferns and which of these are not, um, but we will cover this a bit later. Uh, we have an idea of what ferns are, but if I were to push you and say, okay, why? Like, what exactly is a fern? I think most people would have trouble with that question. And so uh, to get us sort of on a very firm foundation, there are two main things that I will put forth as uh, um, determining that something is a fern. First of all, ferns are what's called a clade. And this is a slight technical digression. A clade is a word we use for a group of organisms that are each more closely related to another member of that group than they are to anything outside of that group. Another way to think about it is a clade is a branch on the evolutionary tree. If you snip off one branch and get a, get a, a cluster, that's a clade. It's one descendant in all of its, uh, and all of its or one ancestor in all of its descendants. So if you imagine, here's a, a, a phylogeny, um, uh, um, diagram of the, of the vascular plant tree of life. So just to orient yourself, because this is again, quite a technical, simple looking, but technical thing. Each of these lines is a lineage evolving through time from a common ancestor back up to the present day. And so the, this period here, all of these words on the, on the end are present day organisms and all the ones that end somewhere before now are fossils. Um, the time scale, by the way, is pretty intense. Each of these gray lines is 100 million years. So here we are back at 500 million years ago. So, so a huge uh, time scale. This red line, just a sort of uh, quick biology reminder for folks, is that 65 million years. And what happened 65 million years ago? That was the extinction of the dinosaurs. So this is the, the main asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. And so only this part of the, of the phylogeny is post-dinosaur. Again, just to give you some sort of time scale. If we take a look at a group of organisms in the present, let's take a look at these ones. We can follow them back. Each of these lineages follows them back. And of course, I have a zoom window in my way. But if we keep following them back, we see that they have a common ancestor, in this case, right here. So they all descended from that one common ancestor, which means, and they, they're not more closely related to anything else. There's no other common ancestor that involves some other organism uh, that's more recent than this one. In order to find the next uh, common ancestor that they share with any other living organism, we have to go from here all the way back to here. And that common ancestor is shared with all of these guys. So we could follow that common ancestor this way, and we could come up to, for example, Equisetum. So these guys are one clade. These guys are another clade. Um, and I'm going to give these clades a bit more meaning later on. I just want to give you some quick perspective. If we take this clade and divide it into two subclades, one of them has a common ancestor here, and all its descendants. Those are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, the seed plants. And if we go to the other side, on this common ancestor over here, we get this group, this branch of the tree of life, and that branch are the ferns. So one definition of ferns, a bit roundabout, is that they're a member of this group. If you cut off this branch of the evolutionary tree of life, you get a set of taxa, and those taxa are ferns, uh, the ferns. The second is that ferns have some particular features of their biology um, that make them distinct. First of all, obviously, they don't have flowers or seeds. Uh, so they're sort of defined by something that they don't have. Um, but they do have a particular life cycle. Um, and I'll describe this bit about sporophytes, et cetera, in just one second. First of all, what do I mean by life cycle? Well, we might think of a life cycle in this sense, from birth till death. You know, uh, some, you know, human grows up, ages, eventually dies, the cycle of life. The cycle of life is not a life cycle in the way that biologists use it. 
we refer instead to the alternation of, of the a way that our genomes are organized. So changes in the number of genome copies. And to walk us through this, um, let's start over here. We start off with a type of cell that only has one copy of the genome, like an egg cell. But through the process of fertilization, we get a type of cell that has two copies of the genome, one from the mom and one from the dad in our case. And so all of the organisms up on this part have two copies of their genome. They're the, 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 what we would call the diploid part of the life cycle. And then in, in the adults, meiosis happens, which produces the one copy versions again. So it's an alternation from having cells with only one copy of a genome in this part to having cells with two copies of the genome in this part. And we don't think about this much uh, in animals because almost all of our life is spent in the two copy version. Right? This is what we think of as a human. We don't think of an egg cell or a sperm cell as being a human. Uh, however, ferns do it very differently. Uh, in this case, I've colored in, in green the two copy versions. Um, so the thing that you see, the leafy green fern, is indeed the two copy version that we're familiar with. It undergoes meiosis, just like animals do, to make a one copy version, which I'm coloring in brown, which is a spore. But then things get weird, because that spore doesn't just undergo fertilization immediately. Instead, it forms its own multicellular independent organism, what we call a gametophyte. Uh, and the gametophytes live by themselves, do their own thing. They're entirely independent. And it's those gametophytes that eventually produce egg and sperm and fertilize, uh, get fertilized to produce a new sporophyte. So they have this whole part of the life cycle, this multicellular free-living gametophyte that we don't have any analogs for in animals. And that's distinctive of ferns and lycophytes, uh, where both of those two generations, like I said, are multicellular, free-living, and independent. So here's a fern gametophyte. And here's the corresponding sporophyte. These are the same species. Um, these are both Cystopteris fragilis, the fragile fern. This is the gametophyte generation. This is the sporophyte generation. OK, uh, finally, they disperse by haploid spores rather than by seeds. They have vascular tissue like seed plants do, uh, but unlike things like mosses or liverworts or hornworts. However, there are two groups of organisms that satisfy all those criteria I just mentioned. Um, the, uh, what we call the lycophytes and the ferns. And historically, because of these similarities, we thought that these two groups were closely related to each other, and we called these ones the fern allies. But they're not fern allies we, in, in, from an evolutionary perspective. Ferns, if we trace them back again, doo -doo 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 -doo, back here, share a common ancestor at this point with the seed plants. And it's not until way back here that they share a common ancestor with the lycophytes, these guys. And so ferns are more closely allied to uh, seed plants, to flowering plants or gymnosperms than they are to the so-called fern allies. So you won't catch me calling these things fern allies. These are the lycophytes. And they differ in some very substantial ways, particularly they have a different type of leaf called a microphyll, and they have a different type of sporangial arrangement. They stick their sporangia on the tops of their leaves instead of the underside. So together, these are the biological characteristics that tell us that we have a fern. And we'll do a very quick quiz just to keep everyone on their toes. Uh, this will be a silent quiz, so there's no there's no honor or no no shame. It's all it's all you know private private glory. What is most closely related to an adder's tongue fern? Slaginella, which is a lycophyte, uh, one of those fern allies, or an apple tree? Because I'm already slow, I'm going to jump in. I, I just mentioned that ferns are more closely related to flowering plants than they are to the fern allies, right? So uh, an adder's tongue fern, which is a fern, is cl more closely related to an apple tree than it is to selaginella. And an even trickier question, which came first, ferns or seed plants? This one's particularly nasty. I'm gonna skip back to our tree for a second. So which came first, ferns here or seed plants here? Well, we can go back in time and we see that they share a single common ancestor. So from this point on, they have evolved exactly the same amount of time by definition. So no, this clade is exactly as old as this clade. However, it's a bit of a cheat because some of these organisms back here 
probably looked more like modern day ferns. They didn't have uh, flowers or seeds, for example. And so we would call some of these things here ferns, even though they're uh, equally related to seed plants and to ferns. So this is a, one of those weird sort of uh, trickinesses between the evolutionary history of a group of organisms um, and their morphological evolution. 